Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited for you all to be here for Ellen Jovin. I'm just going to address the cameras in the room. I'm sure we've all seen them. So we are filming um, for a documentary for Ellen, as well as filming to be aired on C-SPAN. So you guys might be in the video just based on where the camera is, especially if you ask questions during our Q&A portion, which will be happening later. So if you have any questions or concerns with being shown on camera, feel free to reach out to any one of us or go visit the info desk on the other side of the store. Um, there will be a Q&A portion where a microphone is gonna be passed around. So if you guys can just ask the questions into the mic for the documentary and for C-SPAN, that would be very useful. And I'm just gonna give Ellen a quick introduction before I let her take it away. Ellen Jovin is a, the founder of Syntaxis, a communication skills training consultancy. She holds degrees from Harvard in German and UCLA in comparative literature and has studied 25 languages just for fun. Mm -hmm. And she lives with, with her husband in New York City. And I'm now going to let Ellen take it away. Thank you so much for being here as she discusses level of our applause. Mm, thank you. Hello, all you grammar nerds. <laughs> Welcome to the grammar table. Um, I find myself asking a question right now, not of you, but of me, of myself. How did I end up here? <laughs> because I didn't see this coming four years ago when I uh, acquired a folding table on the internet and made a little grammar table sign and then started taking this outside of my building. Um, I think I should establish a grammar philosophy right away. For me, grammar is not about a set of commandments and restrictions to make people feel bad about the sentence they just wrote. I certainly care about principles of sound writing and um, established, you know, established language patterns. For me, grammar, though, is a, is a sense of adventure. It's this wild land of linguistic possibilities um, and it's grounded not just in the grammar lessons. My interest in grammar is grounded not just in the grammar lessons of my childhood, which were very extensive and completely 100% joyous for me. I absolutely loved every moment of every grammar thing I ever did in school. Uh, we can add to that spelling, cursive, all that <laughs> stuff. I just absolutely loved that. I'm guessing if you're here that some of you have similar feelings or maybe you had early childhood traumas that you were hoping to overcome tonight. <laughs> Either way, um, uh, I just, I, I think of grammar, um, I come at it from multiple angles. And I, on top of the grammar lessons that I had as a child, I think the reading that I did throughout my life um, had a huge effect on how I think about language and all the permutations and possibilities. I meet a lot of people at this table who think that a sentence has to be done a certain way or that you can't begin with this word or you can't begin with that word and and for you know if you read widely you see that there's a lot of stuff going on in the writing of excellent writers from across centuries and from across different varieties of English so I like to think of it as a bigger world of possibility than a set of what you cannot do um, or there will be negative consequences so let's establish that first uh, I'm not sure exactly what the dominant anchor for me, the, the primary anchor for me was that just launched me into this gra life of grammar nerdery. I think it, um, I, I will be neologizing during this talk. I like to invent words um, as necessary. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I had a sentence diagramming class with Miss Barbara Beebe. Um, I am still in touch with her, <laughs> naturally. Um, and. Do you all remember sentence diagramming? Did yes. you do it? If you don't know what I'm talking about, we can just test your memory, okay? This is the old fashioned kind, not the, the syntax trees that you might see in, in linguistics classes. Uh, this was a, a tool that was used a lot more, probably it stopped around the time, I, for, to a large extent, it stopped around the time I was through school. I had it in the 1978-1979 <laughs> school year. Um, and not that many people were still doing it, but, but there were still plenty of us. So if I gave you a sentence, would you know how to diagram it still? This is a moment of grammar nostalgia. So <laughs> the dog ate my grammar homework. The dog ate my grammar homework. 
probably a sentence that has been uttered. <laughs> so do you all remember, those of you who did it, you know there's a horizontal line, mm -hmm. and then what goes on the left-hand side of the line? Now. The, yeah. Yes, so the dog, the subject, you write the dog there, and then between the dog and the verb, what happens? Yeah. Big, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're saying to yourself, where was I when this happened? It may just not have been done at your school, and it really doesn't matter. You can have a long and happy life without ever knowing <laughs> this. But for some of us, it was a source of great joy or terror, depending on which person we are. But anyway, so then there's a big line, dog, then the eight, and then what happens with the, the grammar homework? Do you remember what happens Ooh. next? This is where we're starting to get a little bit more detail. Do you know? Yeah. What happens? Well, then you have to take all the phrases. Is it an adjective or is it an adverbial? So the, so the word the goes on a line under dog. We have our big line going through the horizontal line, eight, and then we have an object, homework. Mm -hmm. Homework, don't go all the way through the line. You just go up to the line. That's how you tell the difference between that and the other line. You put the homework there, my, grammar homework underneath that. Okay, we are not going to have to spend the whole time on this, but I, 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 for me, an important component of the grammar table is not just the grammar itself, but also the grammar nostalgia. You know, back when we were kids, how, what did we learn? How did we do things? How does how we communicate and write today relate to those moments? And it's just a lot of fun to think about these things. For example, I have on the grammar table right now, I bring this out for purposes of nostalgia. This is the illustrated edition of the Elements of Style. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yours probably did not have. This was, I think, a, a, a special issue from 2002-ish, maybe. I'm trying to find you. I just wanted to find you the picture of the Basset Hound. I can't find it right now, but there are beautiful drawings in it. In case you get sick of reading the actual words, you can just look at the pictures. But a lot of people come out to the table, remember, the elements of style. So we talk about diagram, we talk about elements of style. Strunk and white is its alias, you may know it under. Um, and we just shoot the breeze about whatever grammar things they want to talk about. On September 21st, 2018, that was the inaugural day of the grammar table. And I had waited until it was less hot because I'm not, my grammar deteriorates rapidly uh, when it exceeds 85 degrees outside. So I had to wait. I had the idea in July. July is a very bad grammar table month. I waited until it cooled down. September 21st, 2018, I walked outside my building. Um, I'm right next to an express subway stop. So I set the table down at the express subway stop. Um, and when I was unfolding it, I felt a little self-conscious because, you know, being on the street, it's not something that I really anticipated happening in my life. Um, and it's kind of dirty by the subway. There's a lot of dirt, and it just was kind. Of, I just felt I felt like people would be thinking I was up to something unsavory. Maybe maybe some of them still think I'm up to something <laughs> unsavory. But I un as I was unfolding the table, I saw a couple standing by the subway station. They were looking over and whispering, and kind of smiling. And I could tell they were grammar nerds. <laughs> so they they had seen the sign. As soon as the woman left. The man came over and he had my first three grammar questions for me. This took place within about 60 seconds. There was no waiting period. Um, and at that moment, I knew, okay, the grammar table is going to be okay. There's gonna, <laughs> there are going to be people who want to hang out with me and talk about things. And from that moment, um, it just, I've had, I've, I've set up all over New York City. Um, people come up to me of all ages, all demographics, all educational levels, and they ask me questions about parts of speech, about punctuation, about why their grandchild says I when um, it should be me, or says me when it should be I. You know, young people complain about old people, old people complain about young people. Yeah. You know, it's just like that there's, there's, um, it's kind of, it's not hostile usually, it's more sort of joking around, grammar banter, you know, that's mm -hmm. how I, I, how I think of it. Um, so I did that for a while in New York City started moving around, took the grammar table on the subway. Very bad for grammar tabling, too noisy yeah. if you've ever been on the subway. There are very there are practical considerations. Um, and pretty soon, I was on the road. Um, and the reason I was able to take the grammar table on the road is because I have a husband who's standing over there by the art sign, um, Grant Johnson, who's actually willing to do things like this. So we went all over the country 
from throughout 2019 and into the beginning of 2020, we went to 47 states mm -hmm. with a grammar table. So I've been in the town, I've actually been in 49 towns and cities because in two states we picked two places before I realized I was running out of state time. <laughs> Set it up. So we went to towns and cities all over the United States. Grant is making a grammar table documentary because what could be better than a grammar documentary? <laughs> and uh, and um, we're do this today is a very important sentimental moment. I thank you for participating in it and with, uh, with me in it because, wow, that was hard. Um, because this is the 48th state and it is the first time since January of 2020 that I have acquired a new grammar table state for my grammar table journeys. And so the only two states left, I don't know, maybe you didn't, Connecticut was one of the three missing states, which you may say, okay, that's a little weird because you live right next to Connecticut, but you know how it is with familiarity. You think, oh, I'll just see that person later. I'll see that state later. Well, in, in January 2020, it's soon be, yeah, things started to close down. So not long after that. So I haven't, I haven't made it yet, but now I'm here today, extremely excited. Um, and now the only two left are Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, so in two weeks we're going to. <laughs> I'm, I do know that Connecticut is right next to New York. I feel like I need to, I feel like I need to clarify that. Um, I've had questions that have amazed me. I've had learned details that have astonished me. For one of my favorite ones is came early on when a young woman. Um, right outside my apartment building came up to me. She was kind of waiting around where people were asking grammar questions. She came up to me and she told me that she loved footnotes so much that she had had a footnote tattooed on her foot. And it said, seven, ibit. And she showed me a picture. It was winter, so she didn't have on sandals. But she showed me a picture, or a fall day, and she showed me on her phone. And I, I felt... I felt complete. <laughs> Another woman remembered knowing, learning a preposition song in school. Do you, any of you remember knowing a preposition song? I do not. Um, but she started singing it and she had choreographed a dance to it in fifth grade that she still remembered. So she did a little piece of her fifth grade preposition wow. dance. So for me, the table is about grammar. It's about language. It's about the thing that connects us as human beings, but it is, so much more than that for me, because I've been able to talk to people who are, have wildly different backgrounds, political and social beliefs. Um, I'm struck on a regular basis by the polarization in our country, but at this table, we can negotiate, we can no negotiate over a comma and all is well. Nothing bad happens at the end. There may be mock rage about the absence or presence of an Oxford comma. But in the end, <laughs> people laugh and they go home happy. Um, I've been able to make tons of new friends, talk to people I would never um, have met before. And it's been seriously the most moving experience of my whole life. It actually makes me emotional. But I'm not gonna cry now. Okay. Uh, and because I I really, you know, I'm the grammar table, I don't really need to talk more. I. I do love talking, don't get me wrong, <laughs> or I wouldn't do this. Um, but I would like to be, I would like to hear, what would you like to know? Do you have grammar questions? Do you have, you know, how did you pick, I don't know, anything. Do you have any questions that we can sort of use to anchor as the talk as we continue? So um, when I announced at dinner a few days ago that I was coming to this event, my mother, me, my daughter and I had a somewhat heated conversation about. <laughs> I ending, love family grammar. <laughs> about ending a sentence or a, fr a phrase with a preposition. Right. And my mother on one side was, of course you never do it. It's meaningless, it's useless. And my daughter said, well, that's how language changes. This is the evolution of language. And I'm smack in the middle. I see both of their sides. I don't love that people end phrases with prepositions or sentences, but I do see my daughter's point. Does the evolution of language specifically related to this really happen in my lifetime? Yes, absolutely. And some things I think are, so language change, um, I mean, even in my own work, I've seen language change accelerated in some ways by the internet, for example. My husband and I have a company, Syntaxis, and one of the things I offer is email etiquette training. 
when I started doing email etiquette training, I always hyphenated email because, you know, it seemed like a thing to do. Everyone was doing it. Um, and then some years into offering email etiquette training, um, we began to notice that people were searching, they were Googling email etiquette training without a hyphen. And if once you remove the hyphen, we start to drop down in the search results. So we were, there was language change that happened because of this hyphen. We ended up removing it from our content, from a book title that I wrote about, about it. We ended up removing that much more quickly than we would have otherwise. And I find that really fascinating. But in addition, you know, in addition though, you know how you know there's language change during our lifetime? Because you're having conversations like that with your own family members. And I think it's so interesting and kind of marvelous that you have this tension. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be viewed as a problem. You have younger people being innovative with language and doing things that you didn't do. You have the older half of the population. I'm 56, so you know there are things that are weird for me to acquire at this point. Um, but they're, they're holding on to certain things, and then you're in the middle, you're in the optimal position, frankly. <laughs> Absolutely. You should relish it for yeah. now. Yeah. I can see all Oh, but I forgot, the prepositions. I was taught in school, don't end with prepositions. The reality is, if you went around recording us throughout our lives, you'd hear people ending with prepositions a lot. For example, uh, if you're talking to your friend, I think it's highly unlikely, unless you are an unusual person, to say something like, that is the book about which I was telling you. I would say that's the book I was telling you about. English allows for it, and the, the restriction on that really, I think, came from an incomplete understanding of the native structures of English, what it is capable of doing. It's not a romance language. Um, it can, in fact, have stuff move around. From a stylistic point of view, um, I wouldn't write this sentence in something I were try was trying to publish. Um, that is the book I read the first half of. You know, like that, there's certain things that sound awkward, but doesn't that's the book I was telling you about sound very natural? Mm -hmm. Do we have any people who want to insist on that as the book about which I was telling you? Mm -hmm. I, you seriously, your dinner invitations will decline rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. She brought an excellent point because English, for whatever historical accident at the time, is the, probably the most uh, you know, used language in the world. So as we go back and forth and the language absorbs new words, new thoughts, and that, we come down to the bedrock of grammar. So is grammar, how does grammar evolve? Not the language, but the grammar rules. And in this huge global society, who sets those rules anymore? Or there is, in fact, anyone who does set those rules. Right, well, English English really is the wild, wild west. It's not, when I had a French question a few years, maybe it was more than a few years ago now, I actually wrote an email to the French Academy to ask them for advice about what I should be doing in French, and they wrote me back and told me what I should do. But I wasn't entirely sure I wanted to do it because when I started interrogating the you know French speakers about their habits, it was it had something. Oh, this is you know we should have a discussion. This is my husband's French high school French teacher right here, so we could have a whole discussion about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you that email. <laughs> but um, you know whatever an, a body or a single person says about language, people are doing their own thing out there in the world. So. The, the grammar education that I got when I was a child did sort of, I won't say that it assumed a, a monolithic approach to language. I think it was more sophisticated than that. And I think, I think the, this idea of possibility in literature and variety and sentence structure and all kinds and even punctuation, I think that was something that was conveyed to me. But um, I've lost my train of thought. Well, you mentioned the French Academy as being the sort of Oh, right. Of that. So, so English, English, forget English. it. Yeah. That's why, that's <laughs> why. is no longer the repository. Of <laughs> that's why when I come out with the table, I actually bring these books here. These aren't my books. Well, I mean, two, this is. That's my book. Um, <laughs> uh, but I bring out all kinds of usage guides. People often ask me, what's your favorite usage guide? And OK, I, might, I may have my preferences. 
but I really prefer to bring out multiple ones and consult multiple ones. I like hearing different points of view. There might be a more conservative voice on one end and then a more, you know, hip, like a hip, more innovate, like more attuned to language change kind of voice on the other end. I like seeing what people think. And I, I think it's a beautiful adventure that you can read different writers and they don't handle the same communication problem the same way. To me, that is a thing of wonder and inspiration. Uh, if you've read older literature, if you read things from the 18th century or 19th century, or maybe you're reading much older things, it looked really different. The punctuation looked different, even the spacing after periods. <laughs> it's a hot topic at the grammar table. That often looked different. So, um, so it's a, it's a. There's one more thing connected to what you mentioned that I think is important. There tends to be a privileging of one English dial certain English dialects over others and I you know as the years have gone by that the, the pro that that is problematic has become more apparent to me so I really try in my role at the grammar table to learn about the specific traits of other dialects and I may even during the pandemic have resorted to watching really terrible reality shows to learn more about <laughs> varieties of slang. But maybe not. I just can't. I can't be sure. Hi, how you doing? I have two questions. We talked earlier today. I remember you <laughs> as a grammar nerd. I remember. Okay, good. Um, however, uh, I have two questions. One is the concept of passive voice. Yes. Okay, which I deal with a lot when I have to deal with attorneys. Because I never understand what they're writing because it's so convoluted that by the end of the paragraph, <laughs> am I, uh, is this a contract, is this not a contract, whatever. That's one thing. The other thing is um, there's a software out there called Gra uh, Grammarly uh, that people use, uh, and I use it too uh, when, I, when I do certain things just to check what I'm writing. Uh, what is your thoughts on some of these um, uh, tools that are out there for people who, who write, especially in business or legal or just to make sure that uh, you know, the grammar is good. So the first one is passive voice. Yeah, I have thoughts on everything, <laughs> <laughs> or at least on these things. Uh, passive voice, I am guessing that a number of you in school were really t were taught don't use passive voice. Some of you may have had a more, you may remember a more subtle version, don't overuse passive voice, which I think is the correct stance because there are reasons to use passive voice. There are definitely many, many reasons to avoid overusing it. And if any of you have worked in a business or any kind of organization with any kind of hierarchy and bureaucracy, you may have encountered a lot of passive voice. There's just way too much. Um, and I see it a lot, I, do, I teach business writing classes, I see it a lot in report writing in particular. People end up with things like, it has been noted, it was observed, and it's just very, they're trying, they're contorting themselves to try to come up with new ways to phrase things. I, I think one of the best tricks of an experienced writer is knowing how to eliminate those pretty quickly through a variety of strategies. It's not a simple fix, but there's kind of a set of strategies that I use to stay away from it. However, I think the comedic potential of passive voice <laughs> is severely <laughs> underestimated. I'm filled with regret right at this moment that I don't have, I have to make a note to myself, comedic example of passive voice, but it's used for humor. You see that sometimes just in online posts. You see people posting things that are funny with passive voice. And also, if the agent uh, is less important than the recipient of the action, or if the agent of action is unknown, you might use passive voice. I mean, I use it. I once had someone say, you have, passive, you have an example of passive voice on your website. And I said, I know. I mean, it was intentional. So I, I think going overboard is a problem. Um, oh, but here, here's a quiz for you. You did not know there was going to be a grammar quiz, did you? You will not be graded. There will not be detention. <laughs> but I'm going to give you three examples. I, I think people also misunderstand what passive voice is. So I'm going to give you three sentences, and what I want you to tell me is how many of them are passive voice. All right? So I was walking down the street. I was tired. I was bitten by a spider. No, I should make it. I was bitten by the grammar bug. Yeah. <laughs> so how many passive voice sentences did I have there? 
Well, you are, you're a bunch of ringers. <laughs> Forget it. Yeah, so there was only one. I find a lot of adults I work with are told by people they work for that they have passive voice when they really don't have passive voice. They see how people start to look just for the was yeah. as though it's the signal. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, so only the last one, uh, he was bitten by the grandma bug. That's okay. the only one. He was walking down the street. Is just, do, can you tell me what that is? Mm -hmm. That is just, mm -hmm. uh, it's just, yeah, depending, well, Usually in English, it's weird. The, the word gerund is used differently across languages, I've noticed. But in general, was walking is either described as past continuous or past progressive. Do you remember that from yeah. days gone by? Yeah. I learned past progressive. So it, it's in the past, but it's in the middle. It's describing being in the middle of the action. The second one, he was tired. Past participle forms often end up being adjectives. So that's all you have going on there. It's just a state of being in a state of exhaustion. Um, now as for Grammarly, I am a terrible person, so I feel I have not lived up to my responsibility as the grammar table because I turn off every single grammar tool that I can ever find in any software I use. Um, in fact, I just did it last week. Sometimes they're really hidden and they keep sticking the little red jagged line under whatever you're doing, it makes me nuts. Um, in the case where I was last marked as wrong, I had a Y-O-U-R instead of a Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, or it was the other way around. And the technology underlying it could not tell that what I did was correct. I think it was operating on probability, like maybe a language database with probabilities, and it seemed probable that I was wrong. People who are very creative in their writing, and I'm not saying that I'm calling myself creative, but if you're creative in your writing, you might find more of those grammar check things being marked because you're doing things that are not sort of so standard. So I turn it off. There was a nice visitor here from Grammarly earlier today, and I asked if maybe I could go visit the Grammarly offices, because I would like to understand better how those tools work. I think they are good for proofreading types of things, because you may end up with something in there that you just didn't notice that Grammarly will alert you to, but you have to use them with such a mental, you have to have your brain on completely. You can't just be the accept, accept, accept kind of person. Or disaster will ensue, just as is the case with spell checkers too. Okay, just, you talked about comedic and, and uh, passive voice. You know what the philosophical definition of comedy is? N no. Is this a, is this my test? <laughs> <laughs> it's the juxtaposition of opposites. You put two opposite things together, and they become very funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to work on that. I'm only funny accidentally. <laughs> Okay, First I'm going to charge you extra for that. <laughs> you, you do that. <laughs> I bought the book. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going a little crazy, and I don't know why this summer it's happening more than ever. Um, I've always used the, the phrase, set foot. Oh, and yeah. I'm hearing people everywhere saying, stepped foot. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this? And I... Uh, just before coming here, I was reading uh, Lucy Foley's The Paris Apartment, mm -hmm. and she said, when I stepped foot into the apartment, and I mm. thought, wow, um, this, is, this is strange. So, and then I looked up several sources, and uh, you know, the, the Oxford Dictionary said that uh, usually it should be set foot, and, uh, but they said that stepped foot is becoming more popular. Right. So <laughs> I'm just a little confused about that. Let me let me address that first because sure. otherwise I'll forget. Yeah. I just looked this one up again two weeks ago maybe because yeah. it's something that I get asked about. The kinds of thing this is the, that is the kind of thing that I don't really store in my brain. I'm more of a structural kind of person, so I have to. Look, have you ever found yourself looking up the same thing 50 billion times? I mean that that's my life. I feel that. Um, the difference between me and many other people is that I constantly look things up, whereas other people just come up to the table and ask me. So then I can look it up again. But so I remember, you know, I read the thing, which is, it's the usual thing where um, the more the dominant phrase is set foot. You see this a lot. But another one has taken hold, or maybe it coexisted, but at a lower frequency. So it, you know, often when you look these things up, 
the coexisting phrase has actually been in use off and on over the years, you just didn't know about it. Right. So I don't remember what the first documented use of step foot was. I think if, you know, to people used to set foot, and I'm to set foot, and I'm guessing that a lot of people in this room are set footers, not step footers, right? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that was really predictable. <laughs> and, and I am too. But when I think about it, I mean, set foot, so you start to look at, okay, set foot, that is a little funny, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you use set in other ways? Does that seem like such a natural and logical construction? And then step foot, I, I can see how that can work too. It feels like it doesn't. But when you really scrutinize the, you know, start scrutinizing the habits that you're used to, they don't always have the underlying logic that we think they do. We just don't notice them because we hear them all the time. So I'm going to continue saying set foot, and if someone asks me what's better to do, I'm going to say it's better to do set foot because other people will be annoyed at you. And that, and that, I mean, in all seriousness, for me as a writer, that is an audience awareness issue. I don't want people to be mad at me over some word choice that I don't even care about. It's really just a right. tiny little piece of the writing. So I do avoid certain things that I think will bother people. I do, however... Although many people in the United States think you can't begin a sentence with because, I'm going to keep beginning sentences with because when I want to because there's nothing wrong with it and I don't care. So there are things I'll be stubborn about and things that I won't. What was your second question? Oh, uh, the second question is, is that um, in terms of a, the Oxford comma or other, thing, other things, that the standards are different for certain uh, published works right. or, or newspapers versus books versus so there are different rules for, for uh, you know different areas. Did you said the Oxford comma? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't mention earlier that that is the number one question I get the thing I get asked about. Now it's not two times the next most common mm -hmm. question or three or it, it, it's like five or six times <laughs> the second most common question that I get asked about it about. And just in case you don't remember the term, the Oxford comma is the comma before the and, yeah. before the last yeah. item in the list. Or an or, but that just doesn't come up as much. Mm -hmm. I, I think, in fact, a lot of people who are obsessed with Oxford commas never even pay attention to the ors, and they just ignore those. It's the same thing. It's a coordinating conjunction. You have item one, item two, item three, and or item four, or however many items you have. But I think, for me, that's not an important grammar point. I don't really care whether people use Oxford commas or not. I use them currently, but when I worked as a freelance reporter, I, had, I was following Associated st uh, Press style. Um, that is, of course, that is one of the books I have here <laughs> on my desk, the Associated Press style. I bring that out a lot. Um, when people use it, they really get used to it. So it's not like they dip in and out of it. Journalists who have used this for years really stop liking the Oxford comma, <laughs> whereas people who follow um, the Chicago Manual of Style, which is that, see, these books are all so heavy, which is why I had to get a grammar table cart. You can't see it right now. Um, but there are lots of practical weight considerations with this. But this one recommends using it. And so it's the clash of the style guides and of the context. A lot of newspaper reporting just doesn't have it unless it's necessary. No, that's not even true. There are a lot of newspapers that just never use it. The copy editors are excising them left and right, even when the list is actually complicated and you cannot tell where the boundaries are, in which case Associated Press Style, even, even Associated Press Style says go with the Oxford comma then, because they're in favor of clarity. So it's not such a, that's the thing. People iron out the subtleties of the things they learn in school and often forget about, or in the book, and they forget the special cases and the exceptions and the complexity and they just remember, I can't begin with because, when it's really, you can't begin with because if you end after the dependent clause is over. Of course you can be, you know, that would be because it was raining, period. Generally kids are taught not to do that because that's not a complete sentence. But because it was raining, I stayed inside and ate a whole chocolate cake. That's perfect, <laughs> you know? That's a great sentence. Um, but, but, the, but the Oxford comma thing is fascinating to me because I think partly the, the fact that it has a name with a capital letter makes it appealing to people to talk about. Um, I don't know if, you're, if you've been on online dating sites, 
Um, it comes up in people's profiles, you know, Oxford comma or bus, like things like that. So it could be the basis of a future marriage or, or you know, end a relationship right there. Um, it's very central in people's lives. And I, I, I think we get used to a little detail and then it's hard when that little detail isn't there or when we don't want it there and it shows up. The most evil um, punctuation thing you can do is steal and go into your do your colleagues' documents late at night when they're not at work <laughs> and start adding or removing them. When you're not looking. That is the way to get everyone to hate you. <laughs> I think there, you had a, com a question before, right? Oh, well, I have, I have just a number of comments. <laughs> but, but with the, um, with like the Oxford comma, I know I had a professor once who insisted there not be that comma there before the last and. Uh, however, sometimes you have a some kind of compound phrase that already has an and in it, and you've got another thing at the end that you have to keep at the end of a sentence, and you really need that comma. So it Absolutely. It or like spaghetti and meatballs. You know, mm -hmm. if I say I ordered salad, comma, spaghetti, and soda, I could live without the Oxford comma there. It doesn't really matter. Three items. I ordered salad, spaghetti, salad, comma, spaghetti comma or no comma, whatever my mood calls for. Well, I would just put it, but whatever. Your mood, whatever your mood calls for, and soda. But if I ordered salad, spaghetti, and meatballs and soda, then I'm gonna put the comma there because I have an and within one of the items that makes it more readable. It's really, I think this idea of consistency, you know, too much consistency can really get in the way of clarity um, and creativity. Okay, what else? Oh, yeah, and you were saying you turn off all the grammar checks when you're working. Yeah, they drive me crazy, and um, sometimes they are actually wrong. And no, I, I say the wrong. examples, and I tell myself, now, it's just as good as the college kid with the computer science degree who wrote the software program. You know? <laughs> so they're really wrong sometimes. The people who wrote the most beautiful books sitting in this shop are not the constructor of the grammar rules for that typically. So it's not, you know, the, the, the art of language is not embedded in the advice there. And I'd like to know who came up with Calibri 11? I, <laughs> I change every single time I write anything. Calibri, come on. Who came up with Calibri 11? It wasn't a standard before we had Microsoft. I Office. think you might be more font sensitive than I am. <laughs> uh, and anyway, anyway, um, I was really interested but the way you talked about um, English being the Wild West, mm -hmm. because of course language just evolves. Language just keeps evolving, and grammar rules were begun to be written long after language was already right. way into, in progress. It had been galloping along mm -hmm. about yes, grammar books. Yes, yes, And in some ways it was written But too. what a great innovation, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, if I remember correctly, I think around um, 12th century or so, France, there, there were, there was the Ars Dictaminis was this like, a, you know, this is getting really we won't. super nerd. This well, is like we'll super that. nerd we'll grammar that, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> uh, so those were written um, partly to teach the language, to teach Latin language especially. Um, but then it became a way of holding back the language from right. evolving, because then if you were saying something else that was going on, uh, you weren't conforming to the so-called grammar rules at that point. So that, so, like, so grammar rules became a, a way of kind of holding back a natural evolution of language. Right. And I, I mean, there's always going to be a tension between what people want to do to bust through things that they were taught they should do. And, oh, okay, I'm going to just end that sentence because that's a disaster. Um, let me start again. Um, I think that a lot, a lot of the grammar books I grew up with were um, contained some opinions that had been that were presented as though they were factual edicts, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that they had the certainty of truth and also a practice behind them. And I, you know, I think if um, people writing style guides 100, 150 years ago had had the benefit of computer databases where they could have actually checked that what they were saying that you should never do was not being done by the best prose stylists of their time. So they were limited to what they actually had in their heads from their own reading. And we know that's subjective, you just forget. You forget what you you know what you read. You don't you can't read everything. So a lot of the the material that we work with now is just more extensive, more science. It's more scientific. I don't think it always you know when you look at large databases of language use, that doesn't always tell you maybe the most elegant way that will impress 
the, upon the reader the idea that you want in an artistic fashion, but, um, but I certainly have benefited from statistical analyses that I did not have access to when I was younger. So if I'm, just one last thing, if I'm looking for where language is going, I listen to how people are talking. Right. And that's where language is going. Absolutely. Yeah. I like your modern grammarian stance. I approve. I approve that. I approve that message. Is that Bobby? I approve that message. In the last 15 years, and I noticed it on a standardized test of children, they're capitalizing sun, moon, and earth. Oh, right. And um, I did question, and they said it's because it's our sun and our moon and our earth. And now, when you go to type it, it automatically capitalizes it. You have to go in and change it to keep it a small s. Right. So is that the reason? Because it's our sun, our moon, our earth? Ah. Why do we have to capitalize? This is actually something that has come up for me because I, too, had the impression you did that I was supposed to keep those lowercase. Yes. Right. And did others of you have that experience as well? Or no? You Have you no, been capitalizing earth. earth your whole life? No. Um, oh. Earth, no. You lowercase. It's you earth, lower. plant, planet yeah, versus planet. dirt with earth. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, so that's the kind of thing that I normally have to look up, because I don't. I, I I capitalize Earth now because I think I realized I was supposed to. I did not know that applied to the sun and the moon, though. I'm shocked. It was in a. Where did you see it? I saw it in the national exam given to fourth grade. Oh, oh. was was the was the test actually about the capitalization? No. Oh, okay. It was, it was just in it, there. It was a question, and it, it, I didn't feel it was. When someone told me the planets, I'm like, but the question really wasn't about the planets. It said something, you know, it was a question, and, it, and through this paragraph, it had capital sun, and I went, wait a minute. And then capital moon. And that's when I went, running back to the English teachers in school. <laughs> I feel as though the children's books I read, those of you who have read children's books in recent years to your, to your kids or grandkids, is the sun capitalized in there? I don't think it is, right? Is it? I don't know, but we capitalize Venus, Neptune, Pluto. Please. Yeah. Why not the moon? Well, I think sun? that's that is the argument. Let us yeah. let us take a look. I just happen to have a handy dictionary with me because this is how I roll. Um, I've been asked why you know why not just use your phone? Isn't that faster? But then people think I'm ta I'm looking at things on my phone, and I want to look like a person who actually you would want to have a conversation with. So if I look up sun here, I'll get there eventually. Um, let's see. Does it tell us what? So sun often capitalized. And that's how it leaves it. I would have to read in more detail to see. Yeah. Do we does it, is, do we have any copy editors here who work regularly with that language? Yeah. So I suspect it's just not consistent. That would be my guess, and I, I would have to check in the in the details. But people do often capitalize seasons, mm -hmm. which I've never done. Right. And I continue not to do. So that one I will stand behind. And generally I'm opposed to excessive capitalization to make things look more important. <laughs> and I'm, be I'm betting that quite a few of you are too. <laughs> Was there I another quickie though? Oh, good night moon. Yeah. Right, we've all read that. Yeah, yeah right, it's right. not capitalized. No, mm -hmm. or hey, little diddle, the cat in the fiddle. The cow jumped over the moon. Not capitalized. No, it doesn't. But those are old, 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 old stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's the last question back here. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> I can hang out. I can hang out. <laughs> <laughs> I love grammar table because it's so low tech. Um, I was curious. You I take about, that as a compliment, by the way. Just <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. talked about its debut, and I was curious what inspired you to go out on the sidewalk. Did you have a goal, or what? Uh, what were you trying to accomplish? I often wear I often wear a T-shirt that says um, "Grammar Hedonist." <laughs> you know, I really am motivated. I, I, I think one thing I can say has been true about me throughout my life is that I have a good sense of what makes me happy. Like that, I can really, I can tell. And I don't like to do things that make me unhappy for very long. And I know the grammar makes me happy. And I know the talking people, uh, talking to people makes me happy. And one of the miracles of the modern age has been um, the internet's ability to connect us across geographic, you know, Ge great geogra great distances 
So I was using the internet heavily from starting around 2009 when I first discovered social media to network with other language geeks all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in large language groups debating genitive case and such and such a language. And I ended up, I mean, it was wonderful because it gave me access to people who had similar interests. I loved it. I completely nerded out for years. I studied, that was when I was studying different languages. Uh, there was a large group called Polyglots on Facebook mm -hmm. and, and just, I went crazy in there. Um, but I was spending a lot of time online and that just is not a formula for happiness, you know, for me or for many people. Um, and I also was thinking a lot about the polarization in our country and how it just seemed to be amplified by the antipathy um, just flowed freely on Twitter and Facebook. And I, I just, it made me sad. I think it's really important to keep human contact with other people. So grammar is my natural focus, but it has, a much, the table itself, my low-tech table, um, has a much bigger purpose for me, and that is to keep reminding myself and the people who visit it that language is full of surprises, people are full of surprises, the street corner is full of surprises, because maybe you didn't, ex maybe you just expected the garbage can there, and there, you know, there's a grammar table. Um, and I think that, that, that for me, conversation with other human beings in the same room is a very important foundation of democracy and life satisfaction. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you.